Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks a lot for joining us. My name is Eric Deggins, and I'm TV critic for National Public Radio. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this uh, wonderful panel discussion. I'm going to introduce our uh, two panelists and their wonderful work, and then we're going to talk about their uh, books. But first, a couple of ground rules. Uh, number one, look at those pesky cell phones that you have and make sure that they're silenced. Because uh, I know that you think your ringtone's really cool, but <laughs> when we're in the middle of talking about stuff, we don't want to hear, you know, Drake or something, all right? Secondly, well, maybe. yeah, maybe, maybe. maybe. Uh, <laughs> secondly, we're going to have, we're going to take questions from the audience uh, probably in the last 20, um, 15 or 20 minutes of our time together. And as you'll see, uh, there are microphones. And so I will let you know when we get to that point, and you can kind of line up. And we'll just take as many questions as we can before the evening's uh, over or before the afternoon's over. So, uh, so be thinking while we're talking about what you want to ask. Uh, and remember, it's a question, <laughs> not a speech. All right? <laughs> I'm just going to say I one time. <laughs> so let's start with the lovely lady to my left, uh, Erica Armstrong Dunbar the Charles and Mary Beard Professor of History at Rutgers University and the former director of the program in African American History at the Library Company of Philadelphia. And she has written Never Caught, The Washington's Relentless Pursuit of Their Runaway Slave on a Judge, a 2017 National Book Award finalist. Erica, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And to my right, Catherine Carrison, who uh, is a scholar of early American and gender history, uh, who was recent, recently became a full professor of history at Villanova University. And she's written Jefferson's Daughters, Three Sisters, White and Black in a Young America, the story of Jefferson's one black and two white daughters. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. So uh, let's get right into it. I, I read both of these books, and as a black person, I did not know how to feel about our founders after I read about them owning slaves and their relationships with their slaves. So how am I supposed to feel about this? <laughs> how am I supposed to negotiate how I feel about Jefferson and Washington after reading about um, how they were slave owners and how um, how, how hypocritical they were in some ways about this. What do you, what do you think? Yeah, I think that um, the discomfort that we feel reading about uh, the sort of flawed nature of our founders is natural, right? It's normal. We've grown up with these narratives that paint our founders in a specific way, with a specific light, um, for multiple reasons. So when texts like Never Caught uh, or Jefferson's Daughters come out, it really sort of, these, these texts challenge, um, challenge us to rethink not simply our founders, but this moment in which the nation was created. And so I always say, you know, I, I wrote a book that wasn't necessarily about George Washington. The book was about an enslaved woman named Ona Judge who happened to be owned by Martha and George Washington. And so it was really, it's really, I think we just think about it as an attempt to reshape how we see the founding of the nation, founders included. Now, now your book, um, there are some people who have even disputed this connection between Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson. So, as you worked on the book, did it change how you felt about Jefferson or changed how you felt about the founders? There, there are still naysayers to the idea that Jefferson uh, had this uh, relationship of quite long standing with Sally Hemings that produced four children who survived into adulthood. But um, the preponderance of the evidence um, really makes that position sort of untenable, right? That, that in fact, that, that he did have this long-standing relationship. And like um, Erica with her project on Ona Judge, I was much more interested in Harriet Hemings. Um, but of course, uh, I think uh, in my work, 
on all three daughters, there's a way in which looking at Jefferson as a father, we actually see him in a very different way and, and in a way that he's unedited. He was usually very conscious of his self-presentation uh, for both his peers and for posterity. But as a father, we see him rather differently. And so um, I, didn't, I didn't see Jefferson differently so much um, uh, than I had before I started this project. I knew he was a slave owner. Um, but to, to actually kind of see him in this relationship um, and how he dealt with the children of his slave, Sally Hemings, um, was really quite revealing. And, and that what I see ultimately is Jefferson is very human. Jefferson as in some ways very, very conventional. Um, and that ultimately, in seeing the humanity of our founders, I think that's actually kind of freeing and liberating, right? So we don't, we don't sort of feel as though we have to live up to these towering idols, uh, but, but in fact, we can take sort of the best of what they have to, to offer, um, except that this is indeed part of the American story and, and ask, okay, so what, what does that mean for us today? And that's what I tried to do. So your book talks about how uh, this woman that um, the Washingtons owned escaped from them, um, went to Portsmouth, um, and eventually resisted their attempts to sort of bring her back into the fold. How'd you hear about this story? What made you decide you wanted to write this book? How did you stumble on this? Yeah, I was, I was actually working on another book. You know, this is what historians always do. We're in the archives, and we're reading through old newspapers and uh, manuscripts, and we find something that intrigues us. And so I was finishing another book about how black women became free in the North. And I was working, I was in the archives, I was reading through 18th century newspapers, trying to get a feel for sort of everyday life in Philadelphia. And so I'm in the microfilm room at 13th and Locust in Philadelphia, the historical society, and I'm reading, you know, this, through the newspapers, and up pops a runaway slave advertisement. And I paused, I thought, okay, this is sort of interesting. It's the end of the 18th century, it was 1796, Slavery is almost sort of dead, gone in Philadelphia. So it's interesting that someone's advertising. And then it became clear to me that this was not just sort of any advertisement, that this was an advertisement from the house of the president. And so I did the pause moment. Wait, 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 1796, that's George Washington. OK. <laughs> Who is being advertised here? What is this about? And what was so, you know, one of the, the things that historians have relied upon with runaway slave advertisements is that it gives us some information, typically about people uh, who, of whom we know very little. And so it said, you know, absconded from the household of the President of the United States, Ona Maria Judge. And I thought, okay, wait, who is Ona? Why did she run away? Well, we kind of know the answer to that, right? <laughs> <laughs> but what happened to her? And I think it was that last question, though, what happened to her that sort of just took hold of me and never really kind of let go. And I thought, OK, well, I, I got to figure out who this is. And more specifically, as an expert in African-American history, specifically African-American women's history, I found myself um, excited but also really angry and frustrated at that moment because I had never heard her name before. And I thought, why don't I know this story? Why, ha why have I not encountered her or her story in, in source material? So I thought, oh, maybe I can find a way to weave this into the first book. And I said, no, I'm going to come back to this. So I finished the first book and moved on to 
to really sort of figure out all that I could about Ona. And that was really a nine year search. It, was not, it took me nine years to research and write this book, in part because Ona was a fugitive. And the one thing that fugitives rely upon is anonymity, right? So she didn't want to be found for the majority of her life until the end. And it's the end of her life where she does leave behind um, two newspaper interviews. Uh, so we do actually have Ona's voice through uh, her interviews. Uh, but really it was, you know, finding Ona and then being committed to telling her story, but also understanding that Ona's life, her story, gives us a sort of portal into the founding of the nation, right? We have lots of books, great books, about Washington, Jefferson. Uh, but I was more interested in telling a story about those who worked, who toiled, who labored under the founding fathers, who built this nation. And so Ona gives us that perfect portal to think about race, to think about gender, to think about labor, uh, to think about the South and the North. She, her life allows really all of us to understand the sort of complex nature of the early republic. Well, that, that's what's interesting <clears throat> to me about both your books, because you guys are talking about slaves <clears throat> and you're talking about women. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the two groups that historians probably ignored during that time. And how do you put together a book where you're trying to find out about these people who sort of the official chronicle, chroniclers of history um, didn't pay attention to or, or kind mm -hmm. of marginalized? Mm -hmm. So uh, um, as you had alluded earlier, for decades, the story of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings and their children had been suppressed. Right? And, and historians, to be perfectly honest, were very much part of that project. Um, and so they, they proud took... Of suppressing the story. Of suppressing the story, indeed, yes. And, and so um, it, there were, they ignored the story told by Sally Hemings' son, Madison, who gave a newspaper account in 1873 so uh, almost 50 years after Jefferson's death. Uh, they, they suppressed that story. They even attacked Madison's character as incapable of telling the truth. So, so um, and this isn't, uh, these are historians in the 20th century who did this. So, so um, it has been a project of the latter half of the 20th century and into our own to even get historians to really take seriously the question of slavery and enslavement, to even think about that experience from the slave's point of view. Right? And then, as, as many of you may know, in 1998, there was a, a DNA test that definitively linked the the uh, youngest son of Sally Hemings, his name was Eston, to the Jefferson male line, right? So that, that's not to say Thomas, but it was, but, but all the other evidence uh, around um, um, this relationship um, uh, taken together with the DNA, as I say, it, it, it's really no longer tenable to deny that relationship. So there was all of that work that had to be done before we even get to uh, the question of, of uh, women in slavery. And, and that, that field is now uh, quite rich, um, and, and, and again, particularly in the last 20 years, what I, was, what I wanted to do when I first started my book, um, I, I was initially drawn to it uh, because Martha, the eldest of Jefferson's three surviving daughters, uh, lived into her 60s, had 11 surviving children, uh, all of whom de uh, developed a rather sizable archive of, of letters. And I remember the first time I saw this, um, uh, particularly at, at the University of Virginia, I thought, gee, there's got to be a book in there somewhere, right? 
And then, and then I thought, well, if I'm going to do a book on Martha, I'm not going to ignore uh, Mariah, uh, his second daughter with his uh, wife, Martha. And then it would be utterly dishonest of me to do a book called Jefferson's Daughters without talking about Harriet. Um, and, and in a slightly different way than Erica did uh, for her work on Ona, um, Harriet was a bit of a challenge <laughs> to try to find because very briefly what we know about her and what happened to her also came from Madison's uh, account. And what he said was that um, Harriet thought it to her interest to go to Washington, D.C., uh, to take on the role of a white woman, and by her dress and conduct as such, uh, he believed that um, she never revealed her identity as Harriet Hemings of Monticello. In fact, she married um, a white man of good standing in Washington City, uh, Madison said, and raised a family of children. So um, a fugitive, sort of, um, in a fugitive that. Fugitive of history in a weird way. A fugitive of history, that's a lovely way to put it, because she never, Jefferson like never I'm gave alive. her, um, <laughs> Jefferson never actually gave her freedom papers, but he did pay for her stagecoach fare to Philadelphia, and he did give her $50, uh, $50 for her expenses. So clearly he facilitated uh, her departure. But at law, she was still a slave at law until the 13th Amendment was passed in 1865. Right? She was, that was what it took to formally free her. And so protecting her identity was what she needed to do to, to, um, to pass as a freeborn white person which again was a, a, a somewhat of a different strategy than Ona Judge uh, uh, did and, and enable me then to, to really kind of discuss this whole phenomenon of passing um, both in, in the 19th century during the course of slavery and, and even today, one researcher estimated as many as 30,000 people a year cross the color line from black to white. I, you know, <clears throat> I'm interested in this idea um, of the modern things that we struggle with that are legacies mm -hmm. from slavery. And I, I've always felt sort of this idea of an inherent black criminality, for example, um, came out of the need to find a reason to uh, oppress black people and force them into free labor. Um, when you look at the work that you've done about that time, about what Ona went through, what are the modern legacies hmm. of what she went through in that system of slavery that she had to find a way to survive? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a beautiful question um, because I think, you know, someone who teaches uh, U.S. history, Afghan history, um, we, and, and I sort of focus on the 18th and 19th century, we don't, historians are really uncomfortable when people ask us to think about connecting the past with the present right, or the future, but I'll do My it job. anyway, that's your question, so <laughs> I'll do it, thank you for letting me. Um, you know, I do think that we can see these direct connections between the history of enslavement, um, the creation of race with modern day social justice issues, right, when we look at the prison industrial complex, clearly. Um, I do think also that Ona's story helps us to think about not simply the connections between um, uh, slavery and uh, the lack of inequality thereafter, but I think Ona's story is really also a coming of age story that helps us think about the importance of family, that helps us think about uh, what one must do in very sort of dire situations, the choices that they have to make. Um, we also know that um, Ona, as an enslaved person, was forbidden from learning to read or write. We know that at the end of her life, she learns to read. I'm not certain that she ever learned to write, 
but clearly there are these issues about literacy, about education. And I think education in particular is one of these um, themes that we can connect between the 18th and 19th, 17th through 19th century and the 20th and 21st century. When we think about how the decks were stacked or the, the ground was uneven, uh, for enslaved people who were legally forbidden from learning to read or write, and that we think about education at this moment, and the students, the children in particular, who have uh, the least opportunity, we see some connections, racially at least, right? And I do think that for the 21st century that the issue of education is going to be one of the most uh, important civil rights issues, right? of the century, and I do think that it's important for historians like us to write about uh, these women, these men, uh, but also to make certain that readers like yourselves, adult readers, engaged readers are invested, but also children, you know, and it's our job really, I think, to make certain that those ideas are translated, are legible, for young children, not just adults. It's too late to wait until college, right? Or to wait until you're 18, 19, 20 years old to learn about these very sort of fundamental issues that we can connect to the founding of the nation to the present. So um, the question I had when I came to your book, the main question I had, and the question I've always had when I heard about Sally Hemings was, what was that like? like what was that relationship like between those two people? And like you said, there's not a lot of information out there. It's hard to figure out what's going on. What were you able to find out about what it was like? I think, uh, actually, I, I have to hear uh, uh, talk very, very briefly about um, a wonderful scholar's work, Annette Gordon-Reed, who wrote a Pulitzer Prize-winning book called The Hemingses of Monticello. <laughs> and, and, and there, Gordon-Reed um, takes on this question, sort of um, probing very much what, what historians of enslaved women need to do, which is to probe the silences. Mm -hmm. Right? Because we don't know. What we do know, what we can be sure of, was this incredible power dynamic and imbalance between uh, the two people, Thomas Jefferson, the slaveholder, and, and Sally Hemings, uh, who at age 16 in Paris, where she knows all she has to do is go to a French court and she will be freed, has a decision to make about whether she's going to recross the Atlantic to go back to a life of slavery in Virginia or not. And At a time when crossing the, the Atlantic was not the safest thing to do. No, no, I mean, so, so there are all sorts of risks, right? All kinds of risks. She's taking her life in her hands at that moment does she accompany Jefferson back or not? In so many different ways, right? Um, however, having stated that, which is the obvious, it's also important, I think, to, to consider Sally Hemings the person. And, and, and a very important point that I think that Gordon Reed makes is that this 16-year-old in Paris, um, did judge correctly that Thomas Jefferson, a man 30 years her senior, um, at least, uh, yes, uh, that, that he would keep his promise that if she came back to Virginia with him, he would free any children that they had together. And for everything we can say about Jefferson and slavery, and I am one of many voices who have said a lot, we do have to say that he kept that promise that he made, and there isn't a court in the United States that would have forced him to do so. So, so, so she was correct in that judgment. Um, she was a person who also had a home in Virginia, who had a family in Virginia, 
who loved um, that, that view from Monticello of the Blue Ridge Mountains as, as, as much as, as any. Uh, the other thing that I do in my book, particularly as I'm trying to think about Harriet's childhood, is to take Sally Hemings to think about her as a person, as a mother. Right? How, how did she raise these children trusting them, uh, tr trusting in Jefferson's promise and educating them so that they knew that unlike every other enslaved person on this plantation, when they turned 21, they were going to be free. And how did she do that? And let's think that, that uh, Jefferson's not the only educator on that mountain. Sally Hemings was as well, and she clearly prepared her daughter beautifully for the life she was going to live as a freeborn white woman, uh, the wife of a, a white man of middling standing who raised her own children in her stead. Wow. Can I, can I just Please? add, there's something that um, you said that I think is really important, and it's about the archives. And for historians who write based upon what we find in the archives, it's very frustrating if you are someone who focuses on women mm -hmm. or who focus on people of African descent uh, you know, prior to the 20th century. The, the archives are, are kind of violent spaces for black women in particular because we're not there, yep. right? We're ignored, our names are often not mentioned and so it becomes a, a different kind of project when you're attempting to recreate and share the lives of enslaved women in particular. That's why it takes so long to write a book, too, if you're, you know, if you're doing that. But I do think um, it's one of the things that led me in writing this book about Ona uh, to make certain that this was a readable book, a book for a general audience, but also one that allowed me, as an expert in African American women's history, to speculate, mm. right? Mm. To speculate, informed mm. speculation, mm. right? And to make certain that the reader always knows when I do not necessarily have a document that says, Ona made brown bread this morning for breakfast, mm. right? Mm. I don't have that document. But what I do have are recipes from the 19th century of brown bread, right? And that we know that the majority of other enslaved women made that bread. So it didn't make me feel uncomfortable to say, Ona probably made brown bread for breakfast in, in the narrative, mm. in the book. But I do think that when we're writing history, at least for me, it was a risk, right? We're trained methodologically to only stick to the sources paper sources, typically. That's almost impossible to do if you're writing the stories, the histories of people who were enslaved, uh, who were murdered, who were traumatized, and whose names were not counted, right? That's the thing that struck me about your book. I, I, I remember reading these passages where you say, Ona must have done this, or mm -hmm. she might have felt that, and I could, I could tell you were signaling. I don't necessarily know for sure. But the thing that was interesting to me is you know, slaves were not allowed to learn how to read, write, or, or write. And, you know, there's a real practical reason for that, right? To keep them from being able to make maps or, or communicate with each other. But what it also did was it robbed us of their history. Because a lot of your book is letters, right? That all these people wrote to each other. And you're able to read these letters and find out how they felt about the circumstances, what it was like to live in that time, who died and when and of what. And we don't have any of that stuff for slaves because they weren't able to write any of that stuff down and leave it for us. And that's, that's a, a, a cost of slavery that I think we can't really appreciate until we read the books that you guys I, I do wrote. think that the oral tradition that's been passed down is amazing, right? And that um, for that reason, we can never dismiss uh, the, the records that we do have, the oral transcriptions of interviews and what have you from those who remember slavery or perhaps had a parent uh, or grandparent who was enslaved. And I think we have to look at that source material in similar ways. Um, and so maybe I'm more of an optimist in that I'm, as opposed to being sort of 
angry about what's not there. <laughs> I'm, I'm um, excited and um, delighted to read or to hear the stories of what actually does still exist. It gives us enough to tell this story. It tells us, it gives us the opportunity to get into the lives of these people who otherwise would have been forgotten. Well, bear in mind, I'm a critic, so it's my job to, <laughs> to look at all the stuff that <laughs> is not there. We, we've only got 15 minutes left already? Wow. Well, may, okay. May I just... Um, well, well, before uh, you do that, I just want to say um, we're going to start taking questions from you guys next. So if you would line up at these mics, if you have a question, and remember, no speeches. I will cut you off. <laughs> no speeches. Uh, go ahead. I, well, I'll just say very quickly, uh, just building on what Erica was just talking about, is, is this question of sources and the ways in which documents, which is to say the written record, has um, always sort of taken uh, priority uh, among historians, but, but uh, over the oral record, the oral tradition. But, but that, um, uh, so two things I would say about that. First of all, let's remember that that is essentially the white archive. Right? Um, and so we need to be really careful about that. So for example, when Jefferson's granddaughter and grandson uh, finger their, their cousins for the paternity of Jefferson's children, right? we need to be uh, um, um, very careful about using that. And then the other thing is that uh, some readers have uh, said to me, sometimes I, I, I get uh, a little frustrated with all those maybes and probablys and would have, might have. Um, but what, what I say to that is that, again, in this effort to speak into the silences, what is so important is to ask the questions, right? To raise, as you did, what would it have been like? I don't know, I don't have Sally Hemings's words, but I have all this other information, all this context that then allows me to think about that. And it's the thinking about that that is so important right, mm -hmm. to go forward. Thanks. Now, before we take questions, I just want to point out one more thing. There's lots of points when I got upset when I was reading your books. You know, I mean, your books are wonderful, but the things that these people yeah. did. The, uh, you know, the Washingtons realize when they're in Philly that their slaves, if they're there for six months, can claim their freedom. Yeah. So then they decide very surreptitiously to come up with this plan to rotate the slaves in and out of what, Virginia? So that, so that they, they never run out the clock on their freedom. I was like, Washington, ugh, yeah. hate that guy. <laughs> Yeah, that is a moment when you're in the archives like, George, man, what you doing? Like, what is this about? And it was. I'm reading George Washington's letters, and he's saying, yes, you know, there's a law in Pennsylvania that says, uh, that was written in 1780 that said if you were a non-resident and you brought enslaved people with you to the state of Pennsylvania, they could only remain there for six months. And then if they overstayed that time, they could be set free, right? So he sends this letter home to his secretary saying, well, we're going to rotate these slaves. And not every, tell them. And not tell them. <laughs> mm -hmm. For good reason. For right? good reason, yeah. And every six months, they would be rotated back to Virginia, or if that was too inconvenient, a quick trip to New Jersey, to Trenton, right. would basically restart the reason. clock. And that is a moment where, as a scholar, you know, you're reading the document, you're using the documents, but you're like, man. Come on, what? dude. <laughs> and, and in your case, um, the idea that Jefferson on the one hand, talked about refraining from using the whip, right, to control slaves. Right. And, but on the other hand, he was giving away slaves as like gifts and yeah. breaking up families right. to, you know, hey, you got married. Here, have these three people. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, Jefferson is, you know, on, on the one hand, he will offer inducements to his enslaved population. He'll, he'll, he'll provide a bed and a pot as a wedding gift if his, if his, if his slaves would find spouses and, and remember, of course, this isn't, uh, these aren't marriages recognized by law. These exist strictly at, at the sufferance of the, of the master. Um, so on the one hand, he'll, he'll encourage um, his enslaved population to find a marriage partner within his own 
um, um, uh, uh, yeah. population of, yeah. of enslaved people. Um, but then think nothing of separating children out at as wedding gifts or so. Yeah, yeah. it's there's. Um, that's when you really realize the enormous gulf between the past and the and present. present. Sir, uh, if you could give us your name and your question. Hi, my name is Rob Rivers from Rockville, Maryland. My question really goes to how we identify uh, people in the past. And I noticed at the front of this conversation, some people use the term enslaved, mm -hmm. while other people just use slave. So I just want a, a quick discussion on how we use mm -hmm. um, identifiers and how we confer humanity mm -hmm. yep. or take away that humanity and then in your book books. Very, very perceptive. She, she actually has a, uh, a, a part in the beginning of the book where, yeah. where you talk about using enslaved as an adjective rather than slave mm -hmm. as a noun, right. mm -hmm. which I think is important. Yeah, yeah I, you know, I think in the book I explain that what I'm teaching, when I'm talking, I typically use the phrase enslaved because it reminds us that this is an action that was taken and placed on the shoulders of, in, of enslaved Africans, right? This was not um, something that we should think about in terms of just identity, right? It was forced. And that by using that term enslaved versus slave, um, it reminds the reader of exactly this. However, uh, I explain also that I do, I sort of move in back and forth between the term enslaved and slave just for sort of narrative reasons. When you say enslaved, enslaved, enslaved over and over again, when you're reading, sometimes that becomes sort of a little heavy. Uh, but you're right, I'm glad you asked this question. And, and I think if you walked into any sort of history class at this moment in time, that you know we get it, that the term enslaved is, um, is the term that we use to describe mm -hmm. folks. Uh, I want to move quickly, so yes, you. Yes, uh, I'd like to uh, address this to Professor Dunbar. I read your book on Ona Judd, and I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you. You really uh, have illuminated a hidden chapter in our early history. And I'd like to make an observation about the book and get your response to it. Uh, much of the book deals with the saga of uh, Ona living in New Hampshire and George Washington trying to uh, recapture her. And on the one hand, you have a person who is triply uh, disenfranchised as an enslaved black woman. And on the other hand, you have by far the most powerful and prestigious person in the country. Mm -hmm. And yet in the end, Ona wins because she's never brought back from New Hampshire never to caught. slavery. Right. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> so, Thanks, dude. So, so uh, you know, I found that rather remarkable and uh, somewhat inspiring in a yeah. sense, actually. And I'd like your response sure. to that. Yeah, no, that's, uh, thank you for that. And I do think that um, w aside from, uh, yes, it's called Never Caught, so you do know what happens <laughs> at the end. You still go buy the book, though, right? Because you want to find out what happens. Yeah, you gave away the ending in the title. Look, How do you do that? Look, <laughs> it's work, though. So, uh, you know, I do think that this struggle between, like, the most powerful, well-known founding father, and this enslaved woman who he could never seem to capture and bring back into his possession, although legally he had every right to do so. He signed the first Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 to make certain he could cross state lines, right? And because of the help from the free black community in Portsmouth, um, of white sympathetic men and women who were uncomfortable with human bondage, Ona is able to remain detached, right, from, from this sort of powerful man. And I do think that it's a story about perseverance, right? And that's not just for her, but when we think about the experiences of the enslaved, the, the mere fact that we still exist as black people is amazing, right? It, is, it was survival, it was a story of survival. And I think Ona kind of helps us to remember that. Um, and I think sort of at a moment in time where we're thinking quite a bit about presidential power, about race, about that I think Ona's story helps us sort of unpack all of that and remain optimistic. Yes, you. You mentioned earlier about how we're considering our founding fathers differently. And in relation to the, the Confederate memorials coming down, some people have taken the extreme stand that we ought to be removing memorials to the founding fathers because they were slaveholders and, and that sort of thing. Do either of you have strong feelings on that topic? 
I think uh, the, the, dif the difference, I think, for the moment anyway, is in the conversation around uh, the, the statues. So, so for example, there are, as this panel shows, there are a lot of conversations going on about the founders and slavery. There is very little that I'm seeing in the public discourse anyway about the Jim Crow context of the erection of the Confederate statues. And to me, that, that's a significant difference, which, which is to say we're not, we're not getting really the history of why those um, monuments to Confederate generals, et, et cetera, were, were put up when they were erected uh, and, and why. And I think- And where. And where, yeah. So, so I really do think if we had um, uh, a bit more context that was visible and a plaque in front of those monuments that, t that, that taught about the daughters of the Confederacy who erected these things um, um, uh, as we're also erecting this Jim Crow um, uh, legal system. Uh, that, that maybe that, that, would, that would be a little bit different. But that isn't the conversation going on. Yeah. It strikes me that a monument to George Washington is not necessarily a monument to somebody who fought for slavery, but a monument to a Confederate general is a monument to somebody who fought for slavery. And, 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 and they were erected. And for treason. And was yeah. a traitor. I don't, I don't. And they were, re they were erected at a time when Jim Crow laws were trying to hold back people of color, and they were erected in places where people of color would have to face them. And, and be reminded of their status. So right. it's a totally different And I do think it's important for us to also recognize that there's space for more monuments, right? right. <laughs> that it's not simply about tearing down monuments, but it's about building. Are you advocating an owner monument? Is well, that what you're doing? I'll Somebody be collecting the money at the door. Can we, get some, can we get some funding? OK, yes. Lou Evangelista from Chevy Chase. I want to thank the panel and uh, for the discussion on the enslaved women. I would like to know, uh, is there a story about the uh, white women, the white wives? Uh, has that story been told, or is that the uh, subject of uh, another couple of books? Sorry, the white wives. Wives. Uh, uh, the wife of, uh, of Jefferson, and, um, and, and how did they feel about the relationships that their husbands had with uh, the right. with the women. And okay. What what was going on in their minds? What could you yeah. enlighten us with? Well, there's um, there there has been uh, some work written about about Jefferson's wife. Um, what in in terms of your your question about sort of the relationship or what white women kind of thought about the relationships that their men, husbands, fathers, brothers, um, there is in, in um, Southern society a huge cone of silence about that, right? And so um, what I've, um, so, so specifically what one thing, for example, that I, that I found is there are sort of these tiny little mentions long after Martha Jefferson, Martha the daughter, uh, dies. Uh, where her son tells someone who's doing a Jefferson biography that really, I'm paraphrasing, if, he'd ha if, if, if she had had her druthers, this is Jefferson's daughter, uh, Sally Hemings would have been moved off the mountain long before. And in fact, she never, what, Jefferson refused to remove her from Monticello. <laughs> um, and and uh, Martha's daughter Ellen talks uh, with real disdain and condescension that, that reverberates across the centuries about the yellow children at Monticello, right? So, so in, in all of those, and, and even in, in sort of the stories that they tell, the white women tell, um, about where all these um, um, light-skinned children came from, or, and there's, there's a, they, they never even mention Sally Hemings' children by name. Not once. They don't even honor their humanity with their names. One thing you'll learn from reading both books, but uh, particularly from reading Catherine's book, is that there's a lot about the lives of the women because, the, you know, there's a lot about 
uh, how they wrote to each other and how they talked about how they were feeling. And so you do get a real sense of what it's like to be a wife, mm -hmm. not necessarily Jefferson's wife because she died so quickly in the story, but mm -hmm. you know, there, there is that. But uh, we're making the point that uh, the slaves, you don't get any of that because uh, they weren't allowed to memorialize their experiences. Yes. Hi, my name is Mimi, and I'm a recent graduate of the University of Virginia. Um, and so I've lived in Charlottesville for the past four years mm -hmm. and seen um, mm -hmm. a lot of things changing and moving um, yeah. through the city. And I've been really heartened by um, the work of my friends and students that have tried to hold the administration accountable. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, and I was just wondering what you as professors would say that students and alums could do to keep that conversation mm. and accountability moving forward because we don't want that to go away at all and there's still mm -hmm. so much to be reckoned with. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted your advice on that. Oh, that's a great question. Thank you for that. I mean, I, I'll, if I may, I'll, I'll jump in and I'll say, I, you know, I think students should do what they are doing, keep doing what they're doing, which is don't be quiet. That's the great thing about being a college student, right? Mm -hmm. Speak your mind and, and stand behind those words too. And I do think we're seeing student groups across the country doing exactly that, whether it's at uh, Chapel Hill at University of North Carolina, mm -hmm. whether it's at anti-racist protests in Charlottesville, that in the past we've seen uh, movements really be supported and moved forward by students, right? And so if students hold, continue to hold administrations accountable for what, their, what the student body has to endure every day, whether it's walking into a building named after a slaveholder, right? Or laying your head in a dorm every night in a building named after those who traded and sold enslaved people, we had to continue as professors and students to remind folks that we have to rethink this and it's up to us to rename it. And what I would say quickly is um, continue to press for courses that deal with this history, right? Because as you can see, there's still a lot of the history to be righted. Um, and, um, and urge uh, college students uh, particularly to vote, <laughs> right? <laughs> to reject. To, to, to reject the displays uh, that, we, that we saw uh, last year mm -hmm. as unacceptable in a civil society. So thank you for your question. Well, I can't think of a better note to end our time. Uh, I've been told that we're out of time, so I, uh, apologies to those of you who, who wanted to ask a question who didn't get to ask one. Um, once more, uh, a round of applause for Erica Dunbar, Catherine Harrison.